Intel's flagship 14900KS isn't a literal dragon, sure, but it's very powerful and has a tendency to burn up things it comes in contact with. So if you're anything like me, you are very excited about AMD's new flagship Zen 5 processors, the Ryzen 9900X and 9950X, featuring 12 and 16 of their Zen 5 cores respectively, managing performance that is on par or even better than the 14900KS at a similar price and with as much as 100 watts less power consumption. We've got a full video on the six and the eight core variants over on the Linus Tech Tips channel that goes into things in a little bit more detail, but long story short, we've got the same support for PCI Express Gen 5, DDR5 memory, and thanks to a combination of architectural improvements and a move to TSMC's four nanometer process for the compute dies, AMD is offering an outstanding upgrade in both performance and power consumption, and it drops into the same AM5 socket that we've come to know and love that they have confirmed will continue to be supported into 2027 and maybe even beyond. In terms of what's included in the box, you get a cute little AMD Ryzen 9 sticker, you get a cute little AMD Ryzen AM5 processor with the same little with the same little thermal paste retention style integrated heat spreader on the top. <laughs> These things are almost impossible to clean. An LGA interface on the back, and uh, that is about it. No heat sink, no accessories to speak of. Now that we've got what's the same out of the way then, let's talk about what's different with the 9900X and the 9950X. Of course, the core counts are different, but there's more to consider than just the sheer number of cores. Both of these chips have two CCDs or core complex dies under the IHS. That means that there are some cases where a single or lightly threaded workload, like say for example, a game, might end up having functions running across both of these dies. For that reason, AMD has actually implemented a core parking feature like we saw in the Ryzen 7000 X3D chips that will force those programs to run on just one of the dies so you can avoid situations where a die over here is calling for data from the cache over here which can lead to a performance hit. Another big difference is that unlike the chips we've seen so far, which are rated for 65 watts, but assuming adequate cooling, ugh, will actually call for as much as 88 watts from the socket, these aren't even rated for 88. The 9900X is rated for, what is it, 120? And then for the 9950X, it's rated at 170. And we found that in the real world, they go closer to 160 watts and 200 watts respectively. Now with that said, <laughs> that's still considerably lower than what we see from Intel's 14900K and 14900KS, both in its default operating mode and in its unleashed mode, which allows it to draw as much power as it wants and can put it well north of 300 watts. The only big difference left now is performance, but before we look at that, how about we look at this message from our sponsor, MSI. MSI's back to school sale is live right now and you can save big on budget gaming laptops, high-end gaming laptops, AI capable machines, gaming handhelds, and more. If you're looking for a new laptop, maybe check out their Cyborg 14 so you can, you know, sneak in a few gaming sessions in between your studies. Head over to the link in the video description and check out MSI's back to school sale today. AMD made it clear in their launch presentation that while these chips are absolutely capable of gaming, they're not really intended to go head to head against their best gaming chips, their X3D lineup, which we've seen in both the 5000 series and 7000 series, but not here yet. And we can see that this holds true mostly in our gaming tests, which we ran at 1080p and mostly at low settings in order to eliminate GPU bottlenecks and focus the bottleneck in our games directly on the CPU. So we definitely saw situations where a last generation, but X3D chip comes out ahead, but also ran into situations like Rocket League, where these new Ryzen 9000 flagships end up kind of crushing the competition. So it's gonna be a mixed bag. And what I will say now is that if you, gaming is your primary focus and nothing else really matters, you may be better off just 
putting a pin in this one and waiting for the inevitable 9000 series X3D refresh if you want to make sure that you're absolutely getting the best of both worlds. With that said, uh, that world is going to cost you something when it comes to productivity, where these chips really shine. Between their higher power limits compared to the six and the eight core variants, not to mention their huge architectural improvements compared to 7000 series, they top the charts pretty much across the board. Whether we're looking at video encoding, file compression and decompression, 3D rendering, video editing, these things do it all. And the only way that Intel's able to hang with them is if we take their 14900KS and untether it, allowing it to draw as much power as it wants for as long as it wants. It's pretty incredible what AMD has accomplished here, especially if you care about the efficiency of your workstation. Now, something you guys are probably wondering is, hey, what happens if you take these and give them the same treatment, allowing them to draw as much power as they could possibly want? And unfortunately, the answer is, not that much. In both cases, we saw an improvement of about three to 5% with power consumption going up by about 60 watts in both cases. So unlike the 9700X, where enabling PBO allowed it to perform notably better, it looks like AMD has these chips tuned pretty well into their peak performance for power consumption range. And it's worth noting that if you unlock these chips using PBO, it can affect your ability to claim warranty coverage should anything go wrong on them. The good news is even if you do decide to enable PBO, these chips don't run that hot. Both were in the 60s running on our triple fan AIO cooler without PBO and ended up in the 80s with PBO. So that is, <laughs> significantly cooler than that inferno that is Intel's 14900K slash KS. The last thing to talk about is pricing. And here, I don't think AMD has gone super aggressive, but what they have done is they've positioned these chips really well. The 9950X comes in at around the same street price as the 14900KS. And when you consider the overall package here, both in terms of performance and efficiency, I think it's kind of a no brainer over Intel's flagship. With that said, the KS variant isn't the one most people are buying. It is only a percent or two faster than the regular K and costs a hundred dollars more. So realistically, that's what most customers are going to be comparing these against. And that's where the 9900X comes in. It actually undercuts the 14900K a little bit and it does give up a little bit in terms of some heavily multi-threaded workloads, but still holds its own extremely well and outperforms the 14900K when it comes to single-threaded applications, which is a lot of what most people are going to be doing. So in summary, yeah, it might not be the blow the doors off 7000 series improvement that some people might have liked to see, but it's a solid offering and is a drop in replacement on that AM5 socket, which is a boon for anyone who wants to upgrade their system slowly over time. Because that's the thing, guys. You can look at 9000 series and go, yeah, I don't want to spend the money today, but hey, aren't you going to be glad to have the option when 10,000 series comes out and these start showing up on the secondhand market? Gotta love it. And you gotta love being subscribed to Short Circuit. What, you're not subscribed yet? Well, try it. You'll love it.